moving on from the first case, which again had English and then the Romance languages, uh, going on to the second case, which has other Germanic languages, Celtic and Greek. So uh, up at the top, I've got Old Norse and Icelandic. Uh, some of this stuff, again, my, that's why I wrote my doctorate dissertation was on the Old Norse sagas. So this stuff also goes back to my graduate school days. Some of this stuff collecting and using Gordon's introduction to Old Norse and Zuega's dictionary. This dictionary is a wonderful, I found this on a street in New York City when I was in college. And maybe that was going to be, you know, a, a, um, a portent that I would end up in graduate school studying Old Norse. Zoega's Dictionary of Old Icelandic left on a street in, and it was on like the East 80s, presumably by, what's this guy's name? Morris Moberg. Morris Moberg, thank you, whoever you are, for leaving me your Zoega's Dictionary on the street. Uh, and then, yeah, like I said, I've tried to, I'm glad that it worked out. I have enough space that I can kind of keep things a little bit separate. I've got uh, extensive materials for Old Icelandic. I've got some more upstairs because, as you know, we're, we're doing a, an Old Norse circle right now. So I'm using some of the material upstairs for the Old Norse circle. Um, and then I've got just one book for modern Faroese. Uh, I think this is... Um, uh, the only book that's out there over the years many people have asked me where I got it how how can they get it is it available I don't know but Lockwood's Modern Faroese anybody who wants to access this I do have it I'd be happy to help you try to access it somehow here it is Lockwood's Faroese um, and then uh, it'd be more logical to have it be Norwegian here but for space purposes I put Swedish so I've got Swedish up at the top Swedish is interesting. I've got a uh, wonderful lingua phone 50, 1950s version and the 1970s version. It's one of the two where I've got like different lingua phone versions. And then this, uh, the, they didn't really call it advanced Swedish or using Swedish in the practice, but Swedish volume two, which would be better in German or something, but it's originally in French, um, is also like, um, yeah, it's, 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 pretty high level so I think they redid their Swedish and it's not quite as good but this older one is, is, is quite nice um, Swedish this one here Swedish is the language that when I was in Germany I was invited to um, give a presentation at the University of Lund and when I went there I was like listening to people and I was like hey I understand this and I didn't you know I'd never studied Swedish but I just finished writing my dissertation on Norse. I was immersed in German and it just like came to life. So I had this book with me and these are the notes and things that I took. Here's places that I stayed. I just, I traveled around Sweden. Uh, I spent um, just like two weeks traveling around Sweden, studying this book and just pe speaking to people and I was able to communicate in it. So that was really neat. Um, so then down here I've got Norwegian and Norwegian is again one of these languages that's kind of complex. Is it really two languages? There's New Norsk, uh, they've got New Norsk and then they've got New Norsk Boka, they've got New Norsk and they've got Standard Norwegian as Boka, which is essentially the same thing as Danish. I think it was one language until the kingdom split, I think about 1905. Um, so uh, very transparent languages to each other to me. Uh, Danish over here, a number of books for Danish. And then again, just to my systematizing way, I'd rather have this somewhere here, but for the purpose of space, I've got um, some of the older languages here. I've got uh, Grammar of Old Saxon. This is obviously not a terribly comprehensive pamphlet. Um, some Old High German um, and uh, Middle High German stuff. Again, I've got some more Middle High German upstairs because I'm doing the, one of the circles and we're reading the Nibelungenlied. Um, then uh, modern German, some dictionaries, Yasemil, grammars, wonderful practice grammar book here, Lehr und Übungsbuch der Deutschen Grammatik, um, wonderful old Sprachbuchhaus from the 19. 30s, I think, 20s or 30s, and the old Proctor print. I love that. 
um, Duden Rechtschreibung and Herkunftswörterbuch Etymology. That's really neat. German etymology. And then I'd like to have a bit more space, but we can space things here to like have a little bit of separation. German and Dutch. I've got um, some Middle Dutch. I've got a Middle, a, a middle Dutch um, grammar and workbook. It's in French. It's a photocopy. So that is one thing that I've got. I'm, I probably have about five or maybe ten more languages that are not out here because they're like photocopies of books that I made at, at very points of the years and I've got those in uh, other um, boxes. Now they don't fit very nicely on shelves like this. I've got some filing cabinets over there so that's the next stage is to bring those out. But I do have uh, a middle Dutch grammar and then all of this is, is modern Dutch and uh, Asimil did make a sort of Dutch, advanced modern Dutch, and I always thought that this, um, Dutch is another language that for me, I've talked about learning um, the branches of a family. Uh, Dutch is a language I don't make any claim to have, you know, to, to speak it with any polish or to know it, but it's it's just not something that I need to study. It's something that I, I know on the basis of other things. So I'm, you know, I've, but just by going through some of these and then traveling around in Holland, I can, I can communicate, I can buy books, I can read them and understand them. But I've always thought that if I was going to work through it systematically, this old audiolingual, you know, sort of 1960s uh, version book looked, looked like a really neat thing to have or maybe work through. Um, so from Dutch, we go down here, Afrikaans, obviously an offshoot of Dutch, and then uh, Yiddish on its own. I've got one book for Yiddish, and then Frisian, Frisian. I have a number of books, and then this is, again, like I, I described with Retro Ramon, you go to a little place like this, and people are overjoyed to help you and have you learn things. So in, in Friesland, you can go and you can find these little um, associations that are there to promote their language. And if you walk into a store like that and you say to them, you know, hey, I'm, a, you know, I'm really interested in learning, they're just, you know, please speak your language to me. I mean, a language like this, somebody's speaking it directly to you, um, you can understand it if you've got Germanic linguistics in, in your blood. Um, and if you say, hey, I can't respond to you, I'm going to respond to you in, in Dutch or in German, but if you please speak your language to me and I'll understand more and more, they're, they're overjoyed to do that. This course, Volkham, is okay, but this course here, Butterbury and Greener Cheese, is really neat. And if, again, if over the years, a couple of people have asked me, you know, how I got this, where I can get this, where they can get a copy of it. So. Again, it's like such a, I don't even know if it's a publisher, if it has a, doesn't even really have a copyright or something. I mean, nice if something like this could be made more widely available, but precisely these little languages are not, um, I don't know, you need to know that this exists in order to be able to look for it. So if you want to learn Friesen, look for this. Friesen, of course, is the supposedly the, the closest language to English. Um, Honestly, I don't find it any closer than Dutch, say. So English, I've got some um, just historical workbooks about Old English and its closest relatives and, and all of these things. So it's not just Old English here. It's, a, it's not just German, it says German language, but it's a Germanic language. So various um, workbooks for various Old English kind of things. And then all of this is Old English and Middle English um, grammars and dictionaries and workbooks. And uh, Gothic is upstairs. <clears throat> We're doing the, um, we've got a circle for the comparative historical English and Gothic because uh, we're using, um, there's some parallel gospels of the uh, old, early modern English, Middle English, Old English, and Gothic. And so in that circle, we've gone through Old English and Middle English. We're concentrating on Gothic right now. So I've got my Gothic materials upstairs. So. Those are the Germanic languages. Celtic was originally spoken in, in Britain, so it made more sense to have that come after him. So for Celtic, um, now I'm looking at it. Oh my God, we're filming this, and they're all mixed up. I've, I haven't. I've, I've got them just arranged by size and not by language. So they're they're about um, six Celtic languages, uh, living ones or, or revived ones, and a couple of medieval ones, and I've got them all. I've got so. Um, I've got um, 
I've got Middle Welsh. Here's a Middle Welsh grammar and workbook. I've got Modern Welsh. I've got uh, Cornish. And I've got Breton. And that's one branch of the Celtic family, the Brythonic branch. And then the Goidelic branch is Old Irish. That's a really neat language. I studied some of this at the University of Chicago. That's quite hard. It is a shame it's mixed up. I've got, uh, let's see, Old Irish paradigms, Old Irish readers, Old Irish here, Old Irish workbooks. So Old Irish is really neat. It's got lots of mutations and stuff. Um, so I've got Old Irish and then obviously Modern Irish or, or Gaelic. Um, and then there's Scotch Gaelic. And then the other one there that died out and has been revived is Manx. And I've got a few books for Manx in here as well. So um, I've got the pretty much complete um, range of the Celtic languages. And of these, it's uh, Irish is the only one I've studied extensively, Old Irish the most, and Modern Irish particularly with this wonderful linguaphone and, um, and other book. This one here is pretty good, um, but it's long ago and far away. Um, and then Greek. So for Greek, I got, again, more range by size than by chronological area. So I've got some specific for Homeric Greek, most of them specific for what's generally called ancient Greek or ancient Greek is Attic Greek, classical Greek. Um, some specific for New Testament Greek, or some as Koine Greek, uh, and then I've got one reader for um, Byzantine Greek. I wish I had more for Byzantine Greek, and then a lot of stuff for modern Greek. So um, a lot of neat stuff to learn Greek with. Um, yeah, that's bookshelf too. So you said like you got when you know have like Germanic linguistics like in your blood like all these languages come easily right mm -hmm. so how do you get it in your blood well that's a mm. chapter of my path of the polyglot book right there <laughs> you have to have historical linguistics you have to understand uh, how languages grow and change and how are they related to each other um, and so if you can understand that in theory and in practice by, you know, in theory, by studying some courses, good courses in historical linguistics, and then in practice by, so at the University of Chicago, I studied um, Professor Tony Buccini, who was a great teacher. Uh, he had a sequence of courses, Gothic, um, Old High German, um, a couple he didn't, you know, so I, I, I did, he had like a handful of the older Germanic languages, and there was another professor that did Old Norse, uh, and so I did most of them, and then on that base, I was just okay, they don't offer the others, I'm just going to teach myself the others. So like, I think Middle English, they didn't have any anything in that. So I kind of got the complete range of um, older Germanic languages while I was in graduate school. And then of course I not just got that overview, but um, wrote my dissertation on Old Norse, uh, in which I also did a lot of comparison with um, Middle High German, and used my modern German as, as a resource language. And of course, um, modern German I had uh, majored in, double major, I, as an undergraduate I majored in, double majored in, in French and German. So I had a um, very strong, although bookish, um, basis in, in, in German uh, going into it. And so uh, on all of that basis, um, when I got to go do postdoctoral studies uh, in Germany, um, that German, which had been bookish, just, you know, I, I put a lot of effort into it in my first couple of months there, but it came to life. And all that historical comparative background, that also just sort of came, came to life kind of like a symphony. I mean, I, I, apart from comparative historical linguistics, I mean, utterly unrelated, I'd been you know, studying, studying music, studying the flute, and just like you have variations on a theme. Um, there's, you know, uh, Moray Moray, for instance, has a Folie d'Espagne, and, and there's, you know, one main song, and there's like 25 variations on it. Um, so when I went to Sweden, and later on went to Holland and, and other countries, 
when I encountered these other forms, that's what they seemed like to me. They seemed like variations on a theme. There was a main theme of Germanic that I had somehow gotten into me. I mean, English is fundamentally a Germanic language. When I went to Germany, I banished English from my head. I made German my operating language. So I was thinking in a, you know, I've been totally thinking in two different Germanic languages. I've written my dissertation on a third. I understood how languages change and grow and are related in, in principle and had seen in this particular branch of a family how that was done time and time again. And so when I encountered Swedish and, and, and Dutch, I mean, they were just there. You know, they were, they were not, you know, they were immediately intelligible. They were part, you know, of, of that sort of whole symphony-like variation of a theme. So it's not an easy process, you know, it's not something you can do overnight. But I do think that if you have that theoretical understanding of how it happens, if you have enough background in, you know, in, in, in some of the older medieval languages and a strong background in some of the living languages, I think that the other living languages do uh, can appear as, um, as variations on a theme, particularly if you have that basic mindset, not necessarily musical training, but, you know, rather than thinking about, you know, I want to, you know, know, master this language to a, a B2 level, but having a bigger concept of, of language and saying, I want to, like, understand where it fits uh, in this language family tree and branch and what its relationships are to others and keep your ears open to how those sound changes affect and, and, and you can pick it up. Mm -hmm. So in the academy you offer Middle High German and Comparative Historical English mm -hmm. plus Gothic. So with that and like a German foundation and maybe some knowledge of historical linguistics, do you think that's enough to really uh, be able to see the variations? Um, we've also got Old Norse. Um, oh, right. So yeah, yeah, put that in there. You know, oh. somebody takes it serious, that's, that's a good foundation. Uh -huh. yeah, that would be a good foundation for doing it. And we have a couple of people who are doing several of those, yeah. Okay, I guess we could see yeah. if they f it works for them in the <laughs> future. Yeah.